Hey everyone, I'm Chris here. Hope you're doing well today. This is video number two of my self-storage investing education series. Uh, today's guest is Mike Mosher with Veritas Capital. He's experienced in funding uh, self-storage deals for folks. Uh, we talk about securitized lenders and balance sheet lenders. So securitized lenders being like CMBS, uh, who sell the loan on the secondary markets once they, once they do the loan with you. And then balance sheet lenders like banks and life companies who actually keep that loan on the books. Uh, we talk about some specifics like plug numbers, as far as rate, amortization rate, like interest rate, amortization rate, et cetera. So if you're trying to underwrite a deal, uh, not sure what numbers to plug into your pro forma for the debt, uh, I think that information will be helpful to you. Um, I think that's it for now. I hope you guys enjoy. If you have any questions, comments, please reach out and uh, let's get to Mike. I think we got everything good there. Um, yeah, so man, so like, I wanna know a little bit more about the story, like how you got into where you're at, you know? and um with veritas and kind of go from there so kind of starting out from the beginning yeah absolutely so uh i founded veritas capital at the beginning of 2018 so i previously okay. worked with a high volume mortgage brokerage firm with offices throughout the southeast and i oversaw the origination team in several locations okay and it was a great market had some good relationships with lenders and with developers and decided I kind of wanted to be my own boss, which is ultimately why I think everybody is in commercial real estate is they yeah. want to be an entrepreneur at heart. Yeah, and there's so many people I talk to that like, it's funny, I was talking to an acquisitions guy who does apartment acquisitions and I asked him something along those lines. He's like, I don't know any one person who like doesn't want to jump out on their own at some point in time, so. Exactly, so true. exactly. Yeah. So and I've thought about it for years, right? And, and yeah. you're never sure, like, how do you time this? And when's the right time to do it? And eventually, you got to just jump in the deep end of the pool. Yeah. But um, it's exciting. It's a lot of fun. But yeah, I do think, I feel like I wasn't the best fit at all times for corporate America and kind of wanted to, to do my own thing. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So about a year ago, started Veritas. And then from yep. there, so now do you primarily do self-storage or do you do some other asset classes or how does that work? Yeah, so good question. I do um, self storage, I work on multifamily, and I work on hospitality. Those tend to be the, I can do other deals, but I try to concentrate in the verticals in which I know enough to be dangerous. Okay, storage, multifamily, and uh, hospitality. Okay, gotcha. Yep. That's great, man. Okay, so on the storage side, the storage lending, um, what types, I know SBA is a little bit, that's different. I'll have a different yeah. answer from somebody else on that, but um, what types of loans can you do within the self storage space, or what types of loans are available? Yeah, so great question. I'll, I'll try to answer the second one first, Chris, which is yeah. what's available in the market. And you, uh, yeah. you already mentioned SBA. I know you're talking to Terry, and he's yeah. the king of SBA, so I'll yeah. give him the mic on that yeah. one. Okay, I agree. Um, and uh, then, of course, you've got a couple other buckets. Uh, you, you tend to think of two buckets of lenders when you think of self storage. One is balance sheet lenders. Historically, banks would be a great example of that, right? Balance sheet they, meaning they lend on their own funds. They lend out their exactly, own funds. Exactly, exactly. And they keep it on the books after lending the money on the okay. project. So they That's don't exactly sell that right. paper or anything. They exactly. Just the okay, gotcha. Yep, yep. And then the other group of lenders you can kind of think of as a big bucket is securitized lenders. And so mm -hmm. after they lend the money, they fund it with their own money, but then they turn around and sell it on invest to investors on the marketplace. Okay. Um, and that securitized debt. And so within those two buckets, the balance sheet lenders are oftentimes, and it depends on what your strategy is, they have different pros and cons in terms okay. of, of loan terms. Okay. And really, for me, I try to listen a lot to what clients want and need and what their strategy is. And that okay. generally helps me pick a path for them that fits their strategy. Okay, gotcha. So the balance sheet lenders kind of the CMBS, I guess you'd say securitized, though, then there's those guys. And then obviously the difference between the two, and I want to get into that, but on the balance sheet, so what, so banks, life codes, like life companies are, is that kind of what you're, what fits in that bucket there? Exactly. Okay. That's exactly right. Okay. Anything, any other types of lenders within that balance sheet lending? Certainly there's, there's a plethora of commercial lenders, but we probably okay. covered the vast majority. There's credit unions in there. There are okay. national balance sheet lenders, which function like a bank, but aren't exactly the same thing, but we've pretty much covered the market there. Okay. Gotcha. So then that's, that's the two bucket and then the CMBS type folks. Okay. Gotcha. Now what, um, let's dig a little deeper on that. Okay. So, uh, what do, how does the balance sheet lender versus the CMBS lender uh, that's just what I'm calling them, but like that type of lender uh, fit with a particular strategy. So let's say I have a deal, like what mm -hmm. deal size do they each look at? What, you know, like what are their parameters? Yeah, so good question. Um, balance sheet lenders or banks oftentimes will go to a smaller deal size. 
where CMBS, typically the smallest deal you can securitize in that marketplace is $2 million in loan amount or higher. Okay. Some of the CMBS lenders only go five and up. So it depends on the lender, but typically two is the minimal. Okay. Um, banks will go down below a million dollars and are happy to do so. So in terms of deal size, that's how they'd look at it a little bit differently. Okay, gotcha. All right, so that's interesting. Um, okay, so then, and then so as far as different strategies, or with, if you partner, let's say, let's say you find a deal and it's, uh, the loan sizes are gonna, gonna be a million bucks, so we're looking at uh, that balance sheet lender. Um, what uh, like what parameters will they work with within that? So if I want if I have a deal that needs to be fixed up and mm -hmm. the purchase price is going to be a little, bit, a little bit below than what the debt service today, we'll get into that. But like what I think I can pay on the debt and all of that. But I need to fix it up, lease it up, fix whatever's going on there, and then it'll be like a nice cash flowing asset. What type of strategy? What type of debt matches with that strategy? Yeah. So one quick clarifying question: Is the property sure. stabilized? Uh, let's just say no. It's not. Okay. Okay, so, so if you have a meaning, so below 85% physical or economic occupancy, is that what you mean by stabilized? Correct. Okay, That's exactly right. Yeah, so it's below that occupancy level. Okay, okay, so it's underperforming property in multiple yeah. ways, right? Maybe it was mismanaged a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's okay. deferred maintenance, it sounds like. So there's yeah. opportunity across the board for value add play. Absolutely. So if it's non stabilized, a lot of times you'll go with what's called a bridge product. Okay. And a bridge product allows you to fund uh, properties that aren't currently stabilized and need capital improvements. And you can go down to oftentimes a debt service coverage ratio of a 1.0 or below. Okay. And as you, as you know, um, the debt service coverage is the cash flow of the asset versus the current amount of debt that you place it. Yeah. 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 Just a little bit of math there. Okay. Gotcha. So they'll do a bridge loan. And what does a bridge loan look like? What are the terms on something like that? Yeah, so a, a typical bridge loan is a little more expensive than traditional debt, but it serves a great purpose in terms of getting okay. into value add plays a lot. Okay. It's one to two points origination, one to two points out. They're interest only. They run anywhere from as brief as 12 months to as long as I've seen 36 months. Um, and typically, the inter because it's interest only and it's a little bit more risky proposition, the mm -hmm. interest is typically in the range of, let's say, 8 to 10% on average, depending upon the deal. Okay, so a little higher rate, but then yep. you can refi out of that, correct? Correct. Or sell the deal or whatever. So, which correct. Is the thirty-six months, and then the rate being that high. Okay, I understand that, but you're looking at interest only. Uh, correct. On that. Okay. Interesting. Yep. Now, what happens? Let's say worst case scenario. Oops, I messed up my pro forma, and uh, we're underperforming, but we're still underperforming, or we don't have anybody to buy it. I can't flip it to anybody yet. Now, what happens? <laughs> I'm, in a, <laughs> I'm in a in a bridge loan and. Uh, that sucker's coming due. And, uh, yeah, yeah. The so, plan didn't work out the way I anticipated. Yeah, absolutely. So that, unfortunately, that does happen um, in life. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has a business plan to get punched in the nose. Wasn't that the yeah. quote from a famous boxer, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> True. Um, and uh, often in that situation, there's actually some built-in fail-safes into bridge lending. They typically have extensions of, of six to 12 months built in. Okay. They oftentimes will let you extend the debt anywhere up to 18 to 24 months for a price. You may pay an additional point and get another six months, for example, up to three times. So you can extend that period because you weren't able to hit your initial time frames. Okay, gotcha. So then there's some, okay, so they've, they've done this enough, they've thought about it. Okay, great. Uh, let's say I have a stabilized asset. We're buying it's 85% occupied, uh, economic mm -hmm. and uh, physical uh, occupancy. Mm -hmm. It needs a little, you know, tender loving care, as they say, but uh, otherwise it's, you know, it's generally good and we think we can manage it a little better than the last, last guy. So we think we can get the yep. NOI up, et cetera, uh, not, not in distress at all. So how does that type of loan look? Yeah, so quick clarifying question. Would you sure. want to hold it long term? Would you want to flip it in a year or two? What would the strategy be? Let's say, uh, let's just go with the flip for now. Let's look at both. Let's, let's, let's look at both. So let's say I want okay. my plan is just to fix some uh, management um, uh, deficiencies, uh, add a little paint, you know, I won't move rents drastically, but I do think I can do better and then maybe sell it in about three to five years. Okay. Okay. Very good. So in terms of the flip scenario where you're going to quickly turn around the property management and the financials of the property, you're looking at almost certainly balance sheet debt, like bank debt. Mm -hmm. It's typically going to be like a 20 year amortization uh, okay. product. The interest rates are based off prime, which right now are five and a half to five point seven five percent on quotes I've seen in the last week from a bank. Um, you're also looking at probably a five to seven year fixed term of the loan, 
And, and one of the reasons you're looking at a balance sheet lender in that situation is their prepayment penalties can be very low. You can actually, in some situations, negotiate your way out of them entirely, or you can make them fairly minimal, like half a point or 1% okay. of the loan amount um, when it's time to let go of the property. Okay, gotcha. So 20 year AM. Now does that amortization, is it, can that change based upon the loan size? Can it go, can that, can it become 25 year or 30 year if the loan size is a little bit larger? Typically not for a bank. Okay. Um, once in a while, it is very rare, but once in a while they'll stretch to 25 and that's because they have a strong relationship with the sponsor. So every lender is going to look at three things, right? The asset, okay. the market, okay. and the sponsor. And all the strengths of all three factors absolutely come into play on every quote. That's why every quote's unique in commercial real estate. There's really no one size fits all. But for a super duper strong sponsor with a great relationship with the local bank, perhaps they would consider 25, but that's very rare. Okay, interesting. So then 20 year on a bank loan, I might have some management uh, deficiencies I'm trying to correct, whatever the, the story is right there. Uh, but we can do a five year ish fixed right. fixed rate. Um, yep. Payment penalty would be very small. Even if I sold it in year three or so, it's still a very small prepayment penalty or maybe Correct. entirely, something like that. Okay, but exactly. we're still looking at the 20 year AM uh, no matter what, unless I've done like 10 loans with these guys and they know me and uh, life is good. Okay. Exactly. Okay, they might send that a little bit more. Okay, gotcha. All right, and then. Um, Let's say I just, I, I'm buying a deal. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've got some investor buddies of mine. We're all 1031 in into a, uh, mm -hmm. a 60,000 square foot facility and we're going to go to the beach. Uh, we're going to okay. pay you know, like a six cap, five cap for this thing. So we're <laughs> paying a little high, but we're going to hold it forever and pass it on our, to our grandkids and all that. What bucket does that fit into? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a, a classic coupon clipper kind of deal, right? Yeah. It's going to run yeah. itself. I yeah, fast forward, that I'm like 65 and you and me, we're going to go in on this deal together and, and uh, hang out. <laughs> that's right. We're going to learn to surf. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very good. So th that's a great fit for the securitized lenders, um, okay. the conduit lenders that I was referencing earlier, CMBS. So, and for a couple of reasons, um, they offer 30 year amortization on their terms. So you get better cash flow over a longer period of time. Yep. They'll underwrite down to a debt service coverage ratio, typically of a 1.3. Um, okay. And on the acquisition side, you can get upwards of 80%, depending upon, again, the sponsor in the market. On the refinance, you would get up to 75%. Um, so the debt terms are very attractive. Now, like anything else, there's pros and cons of every lending approach. There, there are teeth to those loans. They have a yep. feature called a springing lockbox, which means if your financial performance falls below a certain debt service coverage okay. for a period of time, usually four quarters, they will actually draw the funds out into a separate account first and then pay you the remainder. So okay. that's one thing to consider on the flip side. The other thing is that you really uh, have significant prepayment penalties called defeasance. So you really want to make sure your strategy is to hold. If your strategy is to hold, cash flow is king with CMBS. But if you want to let go of it in five years, defeasance can be significant. Yeah, you know, okay, I got gotcha. you. You mentioned the debt service, I'm sorry, the um, uh, LTV. What do the LTVs look like on the other, the balance sheet lenders? What type of LTV for the bridge loan and then the 20 year AM? Kind of that. Yeah, so fairly similar on the loan to value side. Okay. Um, bridge lenders usually will go up to 80% of the acquisition price and they will fund CapEx at that, typically at that same amount, about 80% as well, capital improvements to the property. Um, so very similar. Banks sometimes are a little more conservative based on the local market and how they feel and how full their bucket is. So oftentimes I see banks at 75% leverage, but it's not unheard of to hear a bank do 80 if they like a deal. So the bridge, they will go up to 80, you said, or did I miss that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. wow. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. So 80. 80 on the acquisition, and then they will go 80 again on the, on the capital improvement funding. Okay. I'm writing stuff down. Um, that's interesting. Okay. Okay. So that's, so in everything, there's trade-offs, right? So obviously, when you get the deal in the contract, or at least before that, you're looking at what is my strategy here? What's my, you know, what's my play and what bucket does that fit up, uh, fit up with? Okay. What is the um, general, you mentioned one or two points in the origination on the, um, on the bridge lender. How does that look as far as origination fees uh, and other fees on the other types of loans? It's the uh, securitized and the 20-year um, AM kind of bank debt. 
Yeah, so good question. Um, typically, your bank's going to charge you anywhere from half a point to a point to originate the debt. Um, so it's definitely lower. Some banks will even even waive that fee, um, depending upon, again, the deal, the sponsor, the market. I'll always give you those caveats. Everything I say is, is hedged by that. Um, and then on the CMBS piece, their, their origination fees will waive anywhere from three quarters of a point to a point on a um, typical occasion. And I mentioned defeasance on the back end as the okay. prepayment penalty. And what that is, Chris, very simply, is because, as we mentioned earlier, they sell these loans to investors. Those mm -hmm. investors are guaranteed that return on their money for a decade. Mm -hmm. If you're going to step out of that debt, they're going to get their guarantee regardless. And mm -hmm. that's what you're paying, essentially, with defeasance. Yeah. Um, yeah. If anybody's watching, you can look up defeasance. Just Google it real quick, and, and it'll kind of give you a breakdown of what that means. But uh, okay, and yield maintenance as well. Is there yield maintenance in any of these any of these loans or any of these buckets here? Yes, yeah, CMBS can have yield maintenance. They can structure it that way as well. So that's an excellent point. Um, that can be a secondary option oftentimes. Okay. Gotcha. As well as I will say this, uh, if, uh, folks like myself, um, oftentimes the CMBS lenders will waive their origination fee. And I would make that point in lieu of the lender in that situation. So you're, you're still paying that fee. It's just transferred hands. Mm -hmm. um, they oftentimes incentivize commercial mortgage brokers to bring them the deal. And so they'll do it what they call at par, which is essentially they waive that fee for the broker to make it more attractive to bring them more volume. Oh, interesting. So they originate the uh, three-quarter point to the point that fee can be waived using a mortgage broker like yourself or who, whatever mortgage broker. Okay, gotcha. Interesting. So they'll try and do that on the try and I guess get more business and attract more clients. Okay, well, I mean, that's fair. Um, all right, and then any other costs involved? So if somebody's underwriting a deal and you got mm -hmm. to plug in, you know, okay, what's my, you know, origination, what's my uh, attorney's fees for the loan, all that kind of stuff. Like, what do you kind of, is there a, a, a way to, like a rule of thumb to estimate those costs besides, you know, half a point to a point, depending on what loan you're gonna go with. Are there any other costs that the borrower should be aware of in any way to estimate those costs? Um, yeah, so very, very good question. So you always have to look at a couple different things. You got to look at your third parties, right? So you're going to look at your appraisal, your environmental, and your engineering. And I would say on average, you're typically, unless you want to expedite them, you're looking at twelve to $15,000 for those items, sometimes a little bit more in certain markets. Um, that's a little more market specific. Okay. On... You also have lender fees, so lender legal on behalf of the seller. They have a legal team as well as you're gonna have your own attorney. Uh, I will tell you on CMBS debt, the lender legal fees are quite high. Um, so I do let my clients know it's, it's not uncommon on a CMBS loan to get lender legal fees of $30,000, $35,000. So I do always try to inform them upfront of the pros of what they're getting, but also the costs associated therewith. Wow, so those lender legal fees on the CMBS, thirty to 35000 does that change based on uh, loan size at all or are they kind of all standard buckets? Yeah, yeah. It's totally how much you use the attorneys and how much you want to restructure the loan docs. So I'm okay. speaking in very big generalities yeah. here. I'm using a big brush. So you, if you just take the loan docs, package in a box the way they are, and you don't go back and forth a lot with the attorneys, well, no problem. Okay. But if you have a lot of stuff you want to edit and change and renegotiate from your side, they're continually going back and forth. You're just running yeah. that bill up as you go. Okay, gotcha. So is that yeah. 30 to 35K? Is that just kind of a... A plug number, is that kind of in the middle? Uh, yeah, that's probably in the middle. Yep, okay. that's exactly right. I just try to give a, a rough estimate. And I may be a little bit conservative insofar as I may give you the yeah. higher end, high okay. middle end, but I don't want to shell shock people. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Let's go back real quick to the, uh, so the appraisal, understand that. Environmental, you mean like a phase one? Uh, is that what Correct. you mean? Phase one environmental? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And then the engineer, I've never actually had to use an engineer as far as I can remember on anything I looked at, but what does that come into play? Like what are they, what is the bank looking for if they want you to engage with an engineer? Yeah. So a couple of things, they're looking for a property condition report. Um, and they oh, really oh, so want to you know, know yeah, yeah. like an inspection. Exactly. Okay. okay exactly. Gotcha. That's gotcha. exactly okay. what it is. Okay. Yeah. Then I take that back and we always do inspections. <laughs> I just didn't know if you need like a structural or foundational foundation engineer or something like that. I didn't know if there's something specific, but okay. Sometimes they'll follow up with those people if they see an issue and they need more expertise, but usually they start with the general, you know, inspection of the property and okay. then they'll follow up from there. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and then if we have our own, if you have your own folks that do those things, you can pay for those yourself out of pocket. And, and, uh, and that's, that's how that would work. Is that right? Like if I found, if I had my own phase one guy and property inspection guy, that doesn't go through the lender. I, I get that done. I send the lender those documents. 
once they're completed. Is that right or how does that work? So that's um, a bank may be more flexible on that. You might be able to negotiate that because they, okay. you know, especially a smaller local bank, they yeah. have that decision authority at that okay. desk. But for CMBS um, and, and big national lenders, they will not allow you to do that. They have to pick the third oh, party. Oh, really? So they pick so, the third parties. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. And they, they'll typically get quotes from three parties, three different parties, and they'll show you the quotes and you can pick the one that's most appealing. Typically, most people pick the most cost effective one, <laughs> um, but they don't they don't let anyone else dictate their third party appraisals because they want them to be unbiased. Interesting. OK, yeah. So then if I like, back to that, if I got my own guy, I can tell my own guy, hey, I'll, you know, don't talk, don't tell him about that little thing. And then, okay. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Or you could, yeah, or tell the appraiser it's worth $10 million and you're buying it for five or whatever, yeah. right? They want yeah. to avoid any appearance of any. Okay. Stuff. Okay. That makes fair. sense. All right. Well, that's, that's fair. Okay. Um, and then timing wise. Okay. So uh, I'm doing, or somebody's doing due diligence on a deal or underwriting. It looks like it's going to make sense to get ready to put an LOI on the mm -hmm. deal. Uh, at what point do they need to engage with you or, I mean, a lender in general? Like when do you get that ball rolling? Yeah, ideally as soon as possible. I always, once, once you've got your LOI accepted um, and you're moving through the PSA stages and structuring that, I always encourage buyers to get me involved at that point. That's really important um, mm -hmm. because it typically takes 60 to 90 days, depending on how fast the documents flow to close a commercial loan. And that's pretty much across most platforms mm -hmm. with the exception of bridge lenders. They move more quickly than everyone else. Okay. Um, and they can close in 30 days or so roughly. Okay. Um, Interesting. Okay. But the earlier, the better, right? You're just setting yourself up for success. I have seen deals that have really struggled at the last minute because they're just at the end of their contract time and they waited way too long to set up the debt. And that can be very stressful for the buyer and it could kill the deal. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So the bridge lenders, they, they can move pretty quick. I guess obviously that mm -hmm. makes sense given the strategy that you might have mm -hmm. in place. Okay, so I could see how if I have a small deal, some of the stuff like on the CNBA side, if it's thirty to $35,000 um, just for the lender legal docs, you know, roughly speaking, maybe it's right. 20, 25, just, I don't know, just for the smaller deal. Some of it could be cost prohibitive, I guess, in that sense. You kind of want to, Yes. Am I going down the right path here? Like you kind of yep. want to think about uh, mm -hmm. who's going to hold this long term. Okay, gotcha. And yep, I you, do. you okay. do. It's all situational dependent. If, you, if you've got a property, you build value in for years and you want to do a cash out refinance, yeah. I would argue there's nobody better than a conduit lender for that CMBS lender. But okay. you know, that's situational, right? If it's a little a deal that's not that big and you don't want significant closing costs, absolutely yeah. a balance sheet lender would be a better fit. Okay, interesting. Okay. Um, I think that makes sense. So anything, anything else? That, uh, so like, okay, how about lend, uh, borrower strength? Let's talk about that for a second. Like how does yep. it, so we talked about like kind of this is high level, you know, lending information, but like what, let's say it's, you know, somebody, he's just, uh, he doesn't have the balance sheet to be able to make the debt payments if something, if something were to go wrong, what does that guy need to do? Like, what do we need to, how do we need to structure the deal? Who do we need to bring in? Okay, so if he doesn't have the financial strength, is that right? Yeah. Am I hearing yeah. that correctly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you typically want just general underwriting guidelines. It's going to differ by lender, um, but you typically want net worth equal to or greater than the loan amount you're requesting. Okay. Nine months of debt service and liquidity, not in a Roth IOA, IRA or something like that you can't tap into. A um, couple years of operational experience. And balance sheet lenders are going to look at your global tax uh, cash flow, excuse me, your tax returns for the last three years or so to see what your income is. Um, so if you don't meet all of those criteria um, and it's simply based on finances, you need someone with a stronger net worth and liquidity than you yeah. in that situation. If yeah. it's experience in the space, then you want to bring in partners based on your experience in the past. Okay. And from there, what type of documentation? So you said net worth. Like, do they basically dig into everything that you have, like all your tax returns, all the real estate owned? I mean, everything mm -hmm. that they, they look at, everything, the value of it all. So that could take them some time to do that. So that's why I guess the longer. Um, okay. Is that the same situation with the, um, uh, with the bridge lender? Do they want to see all those same things too, or how does that work? Typically, bridge lenders are more focused on your PFS, your personal financial statement, and your REO, your real estate owned schedule. So what are you worth? That's your net worth and liquidities on your PFS, right? 
And then your real estate own schedule will show not only all the properties you've owned, but historically how you've performed versus the debt on them. And that's important to them too. Okay. The banks are more focused on the tax returns than anybody else. Okay. So banks are focused on the tax returns, bridge lenders, PFS, real estate owned. Okay. And then, okay. That makes sense. Um, all right. Anything else to be aware of things that you've seen, like where deals fall through, you know, because of, mm -hmm. Oh man, didn't even think about that or, or something like that. Anything else that we should be aware of uh, when trying to get a loan on a self storage deal? Yeah, it's always good to know a little bit about the history of the property because in the due diligence process, the lender is going to dig um, historically and heaven forbid um, there was a, a violent crime on the property six months ago and you had no idea about it. I mean, that could absolutely okay. impact the lending scenario, right? Um, if you haven't done your due diligence and there's significant deferred maintenance issues that are expensive, um, that can kill a deal, right? Because that may restructure the debt entirely or they may not be comfortable with the asset. So I do think it's important as a buyer and investor to really try to research the historical performance of the property to the, to the best of your knowledge. Because there's something bad, they're not always going to tell you that up front. Like you ask yeah, around. no, yeah. I mean, yeah, they won't tell you hardly anything up front. I, I, I mean, I understand that. So, uh, But yeah. sometimes you wish they would say something about, <laughs> something about that. <laughs> this would have been yeah. nice to know. <laughs> yeah. You actually put yourself in a bad situation as the seller. Like you can't, the yeah. deal can't get done. And you don't find that out until later on. You spent time on the attorneys and docs and all that stuff. It just doesn't make sense. So, it's okay. a waste of everybody's time. Super yeah. frustrating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay. I think... Um, I think that's, that pretty much covers everything that what will typically happen is uh, I'll end these videos and I start thinking about things later on and we have questions that come up. So maybe we'll do a follow on uh, okay. later on down the road of sure. questions and, uh, or how yeah. a deal we can look at or something to that effect. Uh, we'll kind of Absolutely. Do. How can folks get a hold of you, Mike? Yeah, so it's really easy. If you'd like to pick up the phone, it's 919-341-6700 is my direct office line. And if you're more of an email person, it is Mike at vcapvcap.us. Great. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you taking the time, man, to meet and talk and, um, you know, share your information and knowledge and everything. So appreciate it. Thank you so much. Good to talk to you, Chris. Have a good weekend, buddy. Okay, man. We'll talk soon. All right. See you. Bye. All right. Bye. All right. That was Mike Mosher with Veritas Capital. If you have any questions for him, please reach out. He'd be glad to talk to you. Uh, about your self storage deal. Thank you guys so much for listening and watching. Please give it a like, like <laughs> thumbs up, uh, or subscribe uh, if you're on YouTube or a podcast, wherever you may be. Thank you guys so much. If you have any questions or comments, uh, want to send me a message, please do so. You can visit my website as well, wewantstorage.com. All right. Thanks for watching, listening. I'm Chris, and I will talk to you soon.